This morning we are thankful to be together online again, the last Sunday of our calendar year that the Lord has brought us in spite of all difficulties. We continue to pray that we may meet again together in spite of all difficulties that we might assemble and we look forward that the Lord will open those ways uh, as only he can as well as praying for all Christians throughout the world that they may be able to assemble and overcome all challenges, whatever they may be, that the saints may worship and the gospel may spread throughout the world for the salvation of souls. Today our lesson will concern an important topic as we continue the series of lessons, a long extended series under the title, The Church, the Second Version. And today's lesson, Respecting the Silence of the Scriptures, which we'll look at in just a few moments, a one-part lesson. But as we begin these, this lesson this morning, we look back and how we have covered the uh, definition and nature of the church. We began by looking at what is the church, that it is the assembly of uh, Jesus' saved people. It can be referring to those people in the world, the total of people, or a local church that meets together in a given location. We looked at the nature of the universal church, that is, the world assembly of Jesus' people, uh, compared to the nature of a local church, a local congregation, and understanding the difference between the two will keep us from perverting the uh, organization and work of a local church. We began to look at uh, lessons regarding divine authority because that's how we are to apply those things in relation to not only the church but living the Christian life. Unreliable sources of religious authority we looked at. The only source of divine authority today that is through the apostles' teaching, the New Testament, then when we define the source of divine authority, we begin to look at application of that authority, how to establish divine authority uh, by direct commands, uh, statements, apostolic approved examples, and necessary conclusions. That is how authority is established. Things that are expedient, we'll summarize that in just a moment. And then today's lesson, Respecting the Silence of the Scripture, Lesson 8. And after we cover this lesson, we will leave applying divine authority and we will go to the actual application regarding the organization and work of a local church and then cooperation of local churches two false teachings, institutionalism and the social gospel that have plagued and continue to plague even churches of Christ throughout the world, and the unity of the church closing this series of lessons, the Lord willing. Last week we looked at things that are expedient. The meaning of expedient means that which is profitable or to our advantage. Uh, it is something that we can use to carry out a command of God that is not specified in the Word of God, but it must be lawful. It must not lead us to uh, rebel against the authority of Christ. It must edify the local church, build up in the faith, and must not offend the conscience of a weak brother that is, lead a brother to do something that he thinks is wrong when actually it may be right. Examples of lawful and unlawful expediencies, a baptistry to baptize people, immerse them in water for forgiveness of sins is a lawful expedient. Sprinkling people to be baptized is an unlawful expedient because it goes against the 
in fact, the definition of baptism. Now we go forward to today's most important lesson, respecting the silence of the scriptures. What does God have in mind when he is silent on a subject? That is, when he hasn't said anything or revealed anything about something. Does his silence give us permission to act as we choose, that seems to be the predominant denominational idea. Or does his silence forbid us to act as we think is best? These two underlying attitudes, really the opposites of one another, they dictate how we apply divine authority. And that is the choice that we must make. Again, the denominational view is that God's silence is permissive. Uh, if God is not specified that we should do or not do something, then we have the freedom to act. And that's what they follow. We can do whatever we want if God is not specified, forbidden, specifically forbidden it. And even many churches of Christ have now adopted this same attitude. And so the church is involved even among the churches of Christ in recreation, entertainment, and so many other things that God is silent about in the apostles' teaching, but they say there's no problem. But when we study this lesson, we're going to see that the scriptures teach God's silence is restrictive. We sin if we go beyond what he has specifically revealed uh, in his word. And so we sin if we go beyond that. And that is the problem that so many do not understand that when God is silent, it doesn't tell us anything about what we should do. So we dare not go beyond what he has said. What does it mean when God is silent? The only way that we can know anything about the will of God is that he must first communicate it to us. That makes so much clarity and common sense, but it's so often overlooked. We assume that God is pleased with something even though he's silent about it. And that is not what we need to be doing. If he has not communicated to us about a particular matter, we cannot know anything about that matter. And so God's silence does not authorize us to act in whatever way we please, but it restricts us to following what he has revealed to us. So what does it mean when God is silent? 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes regarding how the Holy Spirit had revealed the gospel to him and other inspired men, the apostles and other inspired men of that day. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. <coughs> and that last passage, last statement, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God, just like no one knows the thoughts of any individual except the Spirit within that individual. So we may assume, we may guess, we may assume or guess correctly, but we have no sure way of knowing 
the thoughts even of another person unless that other person honestly reveals what is their mind. It's the same way with God. We have no way of knowing his will and his will unless he reveals by his spirit his will to us. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speak as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How is God glorified when we speak as the oracles or utterances of God? Not when we go beyond what God has said. Galatians 1 and verse 8, Paul warns the Galatian churches, but even if we, that is the apostles and men associated with them, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. In that one verse, we have the condemnation of all false teachings. And uh, those who even claim to be spoken to by angels, such as the departed Joseph Smith in the early 1800s, who claimed that an angel from God spoke to him and revealed a church of Latter-day Saints that is commonly known as the Mormon Church. And yet, Paul said, Joseph Smith, be accursed and all who follow that false prophet. Those who claim to see visions like the Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen G. White and others that have departed, let them be accursed, Paul says. They're preaching a gospel that is different, contrary to what we have preached to you. And on and on regarding denominational churches, Baptists, Catholic, and even churches of Christ who go beyond the silence of God. When we preach a different gospel or corrupt the gospel that has been preached to us and we claim that we have authority for it, even an angel speaking to us, then we are accursed, the Apostle Paul says, because we have gone beyond the silence of the Apostles teaching the Scriptures. In the Old Testament, it can be proven that God's silence is restrictive. It's not permissive. In Leviticus 16 and verse 12, we read something that apparently had been revealed earlier to those who would serve as priests from the tribe of Levi. Leviticus 16 and verse 12, he shall take, that is the priest, a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil, that is on the day of atonement. But earlier in chapter 10 and verse 1, we read about the tragic death of two who rebelled against God and went beyond what he had commanded them to do and brought different type of uh, burning coals before the Lord that he had not authorized. Nadab and Abihu, even the sons of Aaron, In Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord which he had not commanded them. Evidently they didn't get the burning coals from the altar but from some other source. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. 
So they learn the lesson in a tragic, instantaneous, deadly way that going beyond the silence of God is rebellion against God. In Numbers 4 and verse 15, it was the Kohathite, the Kohath family of the tribe of Levi that was to carry all the sacred objects in the tabernacle, including the Ark of the Covenant, uh, in the way specified by God, and they were the ones to do it and no one else. Even the general family of Levi was not to do it, but a subset of Levites, the Kohathites. Numbers 4 and verse 15, when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy objects and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is to set out after that the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them so that they will not touch the holy objects and die. These are the things in the tent of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry. And then he lists those things. And among these are the Ark of the Covenant. But they were to be carried, especially the Ark of the Covenant, uh, in a certain, the gold overlaid uh, box-like object. That it was to be carried specifically in a certain way by the sons of Kohath. Exodus 25 and verse 13. You shall make poles of a keke wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. And yet hundreds of years later in the time of David, we find a situation where they were bringing the ark from another place to Jerusalem. And yet they did not carry, the ones who were supposed to carry it did not do it in the way also that it was specified. And it resulted again in death this time of Uzzah, one of the ones charged with carrying, transporting the ark. Second Samuel 6 and verse 3, they placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzziah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. Did God say anything about a cart? To carry the ark, did he say anything about these who were not sons of Kohath to carry it in that way? No. But when they came, verse 6, to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him. He struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. Why did, he, why did that happen? Well, in 1 Chronicles 15 and verse 13, David reveals what happened. Because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. That is, the Kohathites did not carry the ark with the poles that the, through the rings of the ark so that they would not touch it. They did not carry it in that way, and so it resulted in the death of Uzzah. Despite any good intentions, despite any popularity of accepting that carrying the ark in a new cart, that it was good, Despite all of that, the man died. God's silence was breached, and they did what they assumed that God would be pleased with, and God was displeased. We find the New Testament also reveals that going beyond God's silence is restrictive. It's not permissive. It is restrictive, and it will result in rebelling against God, and if not repented of, condemnation before God. 
In Acts chapter 15, after there were false teachers that had come out of Jerusalem that had gone to the churches of Galatia and tried to convince the Jewish Christians to, along with the Gentiles, to follow the law of Moses uh, in order to be saved, along with being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Paul and Barnabas had debated with them, and now they go to the apostles with the, uh, at Jerusalem to see if the apostles had been entangled with this false teaching or would they disavow this false teaching, these false teachers among the Jewish brethren from Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. And so they go up there, and the apostles all state, including Peter and James, along with Paul, that they don't teach anything like that. And furthermore, they never commanded anybody to teach anything like that. That God was silent about people being saved by circumcision and keeping the law of Moses under the gospel age. And so whoever was teaching it was going beyond the silence of God. Verse 23 of Acts 15. And they sent this letter to them, by them, that is the messengers, the apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction. There it is. We didn't tell them to teach anything like they were teaching you, that you have to be saved along by adding the law of Moses and circumcision to what you are doing. To whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with these words, uh, have disturbed unsettling your souls. And so what did they instruct? Verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstained, you abstained from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. And so they said, we didn't have anything to do with these men teaching uh, these false teachings, and we stand against them. They went beyond what God has revealed to us, and they were condemned for that. And so we learned the lesson, both in the Old and New Testaments, that God's silence is restrictive. Now, regarding the denominations, we have examples of going beyond God's silence. We just mentioned a couple here. Regarding the most popular thing, the instrumental music in worship, the Lord plainly reveals that we should sing in our worship. We should sing. The Lord is silent in the New Testament concerning using mechanical instruments in our worship. So if God is silent in the apostles' teaching about us using instruments, then what should we do? Use them anyway? They sound good. They help us sing. But they go beyond what God has said. He did not say use instruments in worship, in singing. What he did say is clear, Ephesians 5 and verse 19, speaking to one another. He didn't say playing for one another. He said speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. 
And so we leave it at that. Colossians 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let me ask you a simple question. Can I teach anybody with a piano or a guitar? Can I teach anybody anything by playing a piano or a guitar? No. The answer is no. The only way I can teach somebody is by either speaking a, 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 a normal, uh, in a normal way or by singing by singing something, but by just playing an instrument, I can't teach anybody anything as far as a spiritual lesson is concerned. We are to sing from the heart, giving thanks to the Lord, those spiritual songs. And the instruments are to be left aside because God is silent. What about infant baptism? The Lord commands those who believe in Jesus to repent of their sins, confess Jesus as the Son of God, and be baptized, immersed in water, for the forgiveness of their sins. But the Lord is silent about commanding infants to be baptized, those who can neither believe, they can't believe in Christ. They can't repent of sins. They don't have any sins to repent of, even if they did. They're, they're infants. They, they can't confess Jesus as the Son of God, and yet those are the written conditions of baptism. Jesus himself, in Mark 16 and verse 16, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. That is, a person who is going to be baptized must believe in Christ. They also must repent of their sins. First preaching of the gospel, when they cried out, What shall we do? Peter answered in verse 38. Peter said to them, Acts 2, 38, Repent, and each of you be baptized, immersed in water, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But they were to be baptized upon their belief in Jesus and repentance of sins for the forgiveness of their sins. So they had to be old enough to meet the conditions of baptism to become a Christian. Infants cannot do that. Acts 8.36, when the Ethiopian eunuch believed in Jesus, apparently was willing to repent of his sins, wanted to be baptized into relationship with Christ. Acts 8.36, as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, confessing his faith in Jesus. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. This is what we must stay with, the conditions of baptism, faith, repentance, and confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and then being baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins. Infants don't fit into that in any way, shape, or form. And so we don't do it. We don't encourage anybody else to do it. We don't promote it. We don't follow it. And then finally in our lesson. It would be easy to pick on others, but even among those who claim to be brethren among churches of Christ, there are many local churches of Christ that have gone beyond the silence of the Scripture, so many, because these things are so popular among brethren and the world. They provide entertainment and recreation for their members and also for those in the world. 
The Lord is silent about local churches providing these things, that is, entertainment and recreation. The Lord has plainly revealed that local churches are not even to provide benevolence to needy saints unless families are unable to provide their needs. And yet, recreation and entertainment, which is not a need, that can easily be provided by individual families. They're willing to provide those things going beyond the silence of God. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, it is clear. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It is our individual responsibility as Christians to provide for our own families first. And then if we are unable to do that due to circumstances beyond our control, then that is where the church steps in and provides that which is lacking, the local congregation and maybe even outside congregations if the local congregation cannot do it on, uh, in, on their own. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 16, If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them, and the church must not be burdened, so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. So the point is that even if a widow can help her family members, she is to do it. And if she can't do it, then the church steps in if the families are unable to do it. And so that's why we conclude that recreation and entertainment, which the Lord is silent about, has no place in the work of a local church. It is frivolous. It is uh, superfluous. It is unnecessary. It is something God is silent about. And therefore, no attention should be given or resources by a local church to those things that God is silent about. Then many churches of Christ, they send money to a sponsoring church, an intervening church, uh, to support preachers. That is, they will send money to a church and let that church decide what preachers will be supported. But the New Testament has revealed that the only time that local churches sent money directly to other ch local churches was to relieve the needy saints in those receiving churches. That is, for benevolence. The New Testament reveals, though, that local churches would send money directly to preachers who they supported. So there's a difference there. They sent money directly to churches only in the cases of benevolence. When sending to an evangelist, they would send that money directly, not through. The scriptures are silent about a third party in between a supporting church and preachers. They are silent about that. So we should not be practicing those type of things where we send money to congregations and then let those congregations uh, choose how much and to whom uh, what preachers will be supported. That is unscriptural. Romans chapter 15 and verse 25. But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints, Paul said. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So the point is that they sent money to help needy saints to the church in Rome. They did not send money that Rome then decided what evangelists they would support. The money to the evangelists is sent directly to the evangelists according to the word of God, the apostles' teaching. One of the passages, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 8, Paul said, I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you 
And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to any of anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. So the brethren in Macedonia, they sent directly to the Apostle Paul even when he was preaching in Corinth. And so that's what we should do. Send directly to the evangelist, not through third-party churches or through third-party missionary societies, evangelistic societies, organizations, whatever they may be called. What does it mean when God is silent? It means that we cannot know anything about his will. We don't go beyond that silence. It is restrictive. We stay with what God has revealed. That can be confirmed in both the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, that God's silence is restrictive. Some denominational examples and even some churches of Christ examples regarding the going beyond God's silence. We just mentioned a few. There are so many. But this lesson has been designed to remind us that we are to stay with the apostles' teaching, and we pray that the Lord will give us time. The Lord will give us time that if we are going beyond those things, that we may be humble enough to see those things, and willing enough to change and get away from those things, wherein we are going beyond this silence and only practice, and rejoice in those things that are revealed by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, through the apostles' teaching, the New Testament. If anyone is subject to the invitation of Christ, we would encourage you to respond today, not in ways that cannot be found in the apostles' teaching, like the sinner's prayer, or by infant baptism, or any other type of way, but through faith in the Lord Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing him as the Son of God, be baptized as soon as you can for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of Jesus. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus, by his gracious power, coming up out of the water by the grace of God, ready to live in newness of life, guided by the apostles' teaching that you may be continuously transformed into the image of Jesus by his word. And as we live as Christians, when we fall back into sin, which we do, let us be willing to repent and pray that we may be restored back to God, asking his forgiveness, confessing those sins to him and praying for one another if those sins be of such a nature that we need to call upon each other, uh, that they, we can pray for one another and seek the Lord's forgiveness, that we may be cleansed again by the blood of Jesus. If anyone is subject to that gracious gospel, we would encourage you to come. Encourage you to come now as we call the lesson to a close, bring the lesson to a close today. Won't you respond to the gospel that you may be saved by the grace of God?